All right, what's up ladies and gentlemen? I haven't done a video in a while, so I figured it was time to do a video. So the last video I was working on these tweezer caps and I don't remember if I showed the actual tweezers, but the tweezer caps are now working really good. And uh, that was weeks ago, so I'm trying to think what I did. Um, here is the cap from the last video. As you can see, it's finished on the back backside. Um, I think I was transferring them here and then I wanted to cut this, uh, this shape down by transferring them. And I think probably in that video, I think I ended with me not being able to transfer them or I stopped right before trying to transfer them. So um, we'll, we'll go over the tweezers first. So these are the tweezers themselves, which I have not done a video on the fixturing or the machining of these, but essentially they're tweezers like in your bathroom and they go in this cap like that, they snap in, and you can take them out one-handed and you can put them back in one-handed, and the cap protects the tweezer from life and all its pitfalls, and uh, the cap itself lives on your key ring, so the key ring goes in here, and the cool thing is because it's got this slant, the key ring is really easy to put into here. I hate, like, I have really short nails, um, you know, nail biter, and uh, I can never pull key rings, and I really hate that. So this makes it super easy. You just have to pull the key ring very, um, not open very much, and to be able to slip that in there. So that's kind of cool. I am thinking about doing a little bit more of a gradual slope down, starting like right here and going up. So cutting more towards center, uh, just because that would even that would increase the space. It would decrease the space it takes on your keys and kind of like it bumps up against things. Right now it works really good, but um, that's probably just the future plan thing. I have like 10 of these caps, so I want to get rid of those first. And yeah, they're for sale on the website and I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. I've sold uh, 45 so far. I did an Instagram giveaway, which was a very interesting um, experience the other day. It finished last night actually. Um, so I promoted it and this is going to be a talk heavy video i think uh, i promoted it like i you know i paid instagram to promote it basically and i promoted it using like specific tags hashtags and i did like edc and everyday carry and i spent 30 dollars over two days and i ended up getting 52 followers directly from the promotion so as a cost of follower gain that's pretty bad honestly especially because it was a promotion or it was a giveaway um so you had people probably following me i don't know but probably following me to enter the giveaway because that was one of the requirements so yeah that was kind of expensive um i probably i'm not very seasoned as far as advertising goes so that was probably a big portion of me um, i also didn't have a video in the promotion or in the giveaway and i probably should have people are people like videos i mean obviously you're scrolling through instagram and you're i think you're much more likely to stop at a video um but i didn't have a video of the ones i was giving away because i didn't want to scratch them <laughs> so what i should have done is made like a third pair and then use that as like video material and then uh give given those away at some other point Anyways, that's uh, what I've been doing tweezer-wise. Uh, I started making these tweezers because I was waiting on the heat treat oven for the knives, which I now have, and I have been using, not to do blades yet, but I've done uh, lock bar inserts, and I don't have any, I have the stock, and that's out of the heat treat oven. It's a 17.4 H900, which means it was uh, heated to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, for an hour and then let cool back to room temperature. And it's a precipitation hardening, I guess. So as it cools, it hardens, I think. I think that's what that means. So uh, the oven works really good. You don't have to babysit it when you do that because you just, it's like programmable. So that's really cool. Uh, so that's the only, that's why I started doing the tweezers is because I didn't want to starve because some of you know that I don't have a day job anymore. I quit. Uh, so <laughs> this is what I'm doing now <laughs> and uh, yeah I don't want to starve so the tweezers came from that and that's really it it uh, I don't know from design to 
actually getting the tweezers took, took a couple weeks and it's been a couple months to where I am right now and they're going along pretty good. Um, response wise has been really good but selling them has been not as not as big as I was hoping, like I was hoping for more sales. And I think the reason is because I'm only selling them, I've only been selling them on Instagram. And uh, there's a lot of people following me on Instagram and, and including people who are sub here that um, I don't like to use the word like sympathy, but a lot of the orders in the, in the beginning are typically people who are like supportive of what you're doing. So I like call them sympathy buyers and it has, it's not a, like a derogatory thing. That's just kind of the nature of um, the initial sales. So now it's like two a week I sell and I would like to sell like two every two days. So one a day. And to do that, you have to spend money and get them in front of people's eyes. So I started a Kickstarter for them and i'll put the link in the description it's not been approved yet but i finished working on it yesterday so if you are interested in double supporting me then you can check out the kickstarter they're a little bit below retail um obviously as an incentive i don't want to bs you guys so that's this is all true stuff um material has gotten really expensive for titanium so that's why initially i was selling the capped version like any options for 46 and now they're 53 on the website and uh, that's because I actually had to order titanium and I mean the tweezers started out as scrap from the knife handles so material cost was already absorbed by the knives and now that I'm having to buy material I'm like oh god material is really expensive now as you know across the board obviously I've been you know keeping my lumber hostage so yeah that's uh that's it. That's what I've been doing the last couple of weeks. Uh, working on the website, getting all that stuff has been very complicated and quite the learning curve. I'm running a WooCommerce website and uh, Elementor is the website builder, which is basically a WordPress, it's a WordPress website. And uh, I said all that backwards, but that's what I'm using for everything. And uh, yeah, basically handling orders, like printing the packing slips and uh, keeping on task has been very difficult for me personally. I have a really hard time keeping on task personally. I have like pretty bad ADHD. So that's been quite the learning experience, but I think I have an okay system going on. And uh, so basically an order comes in and I print like a uh, packing label and I'm gonna grab one here as an example. And I'll probably have to white out the information or maybe I can do this. So this is like an example of what I've been doing. So the website has all the details on here and then you print the packing slip for the order and then I just follow the packing slip, which I think is is pretty good, but the way like the attributes and the variations work on the website, they don't print very, it's not very like in order. So sometimes I find myself going, oh, well that was a blasted cap, like sandblasted. And then like either I forget or it was not in the it was not like an order you would naturally like process things so then like you do all this work and you're like oh the cap was supposed to be blasted or it was not supposed to be blasted so that needs a little bit of work and uh, also what happens is I print the packing slip and I want to include the packing slip in the package um, but they become really dirty as I handle them and walk around and also there's way too much walking around going on because what's happening is I'm making tweezers on the mill, I'm making caps on the lathe, that's not a problem. Um, but then it's like, where do you take the raw parts? I've been putting them here on the desk and uh, that be makes the de desk become really messy. So then it's like, okay, well you have these raw parts in, these, in the, like the little bins that are labeled, that's good. But then like, okay, this one needs to be tumbled, this one needs to be blasted. So do you separate them? like per order and then do them like as a as the orders come in or do you you stock up like here's 15 blasted tweezers ready to go kind of thing and then what happens is i have to deburr them by hand every single one of them on the buffing wheel so i'm taking both the cap and the tweezer from right here where you guys are sitting and i'm walking over there to the grinder and then i'm deburring them and then what i'm doing is then i'm taking them and then i'm walking all the way back over here where the anodizing stuff is. And so like, it's kind of a convoluted mess and I'd like to like, I don't know, like streamline it, but I'm pretty sure every single business that's ever 
handle the product is running, has run, is run, or will run into exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, maybe I'm just complaining because I don't have a short distance to walk. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a hundred steps back to the table. But after a whole day of doing that, I mean, you're wasting a lot of time walking back and forth. So anyways, that's a, a really long-winded version of my current troubles. So I do want to talk about the lathe and how I got the caps done. And so we'll go over there and talk about that. Okay, so the last few videos I've been producing have been pretty much exclusively lathe content, which I'm sure some of you like and some of you don't like. Um, so obviously one of the biggest hurdles with running this lathe has been my obsession with wanting to transfer uh, parts. And that obsession comes from the fact that everyone and their mother talks about automation and you get into this mindset that everything needs to be one and done off the machine. Now, that's obviously not uh, sustainable to everything or applicable to everything, but like when I'm making these caps, I go, okay, I've designed them. It's one of the first parts I've ever designed to be machined as opposed to be a pain in the, you know what. So it's designed to come off the lathe done. Like it's milled with the C axis for, to do the side parts. Uh, let me go grab one. So it's uh, milled on the lathe itself I'm doing these pockets and the front pocket all on the lathe and then I am transferring it and then cutting this slant in the sub spindle and so what is ejected is essentially a done part now the problem is I don't have a y-axis or more than one radial tool I guess you wouldn't need a y-axis for this but you can see there's a burr right on the top here, or you might not be able to, but it's supposed to be more of an oval-ish shape. And there is a burr on the top right here. So, and then there's also a burr down here on the actual pocket the tweezer ears snap into. So what's been happening, and this, this isn't a problem in reality, is I have to hand deburr with a hand tool all these little pockets. I would like to get an air deburr, but I don't have any money, <laughs> but maybe in the future. So, um, I mean, in reality, this is really good. This is what I'm getting off the lathe, which is actually really impressive. But my point is my last couple videos have been about the sub spindle and my problem with the jaws and not being able to get jaws that either, uh, stay formed correctly and money and when you don't have any real income because I don't have a day job uh, things become more and more like snowball effect so I decided that I was going to actually get a collet chuck a dead length collet chuck for the sub spindle now it's important that the sub spindle has a dead length and dead length means when the material is grabbed by the collet it doesn't shift it doesn't want to pull the material in a direction because the collet's moving. What's happening in this is, as opposed to the collet moving backwards against the taper, the taper actually moves forward against, or the, the chuck moves forward against the taper. So what you have is the collet just closes down and open, or open, uh, open and closed, as opposed to uh, pull, uh, pull to close, basically, is, is what it's called. So when you transfer you want you want this not to pull the stock in a direction because what happens is i found is the the amount it pulls is, is oh, it's kind of random like within a couple thousands and if you're trying to do really precise work what ends up happening is your work becomes very unprecise because of this uh this kind of shifting so the problem with buying a dead length collet chuck is they're really 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 expensive so this is a ATS, I think. I think that's what it is. That's what my main uh, 16C um, call it is. And so buying one of these new, they're like $3,600, and I do not have, th I did, do not and uh, will not have $3,600 in the future. <laughs> will I open the future? Like, I didn't have $3,600 to spend on a collet chuck. 
So of course, here I am scouring eBay looking for one, and eventually I was like, I don't want to spend over a thousand dollars, and eventually I spent fifteen hundred dollars on this one because there's not a lot out there. Um, so this is, if you buy it retail, brand new, it's thirty six hundred and change, and uh, obviously this one's used, so uh, so I spent fifteen hundred on it. Um, there was another problem with it. One the draw tube so there's a draw tube inside the sub spindle and that's what actually actuates whatever is hooked to the front the draw tube threads were too small for this uh chuck this chuck is actually meant to go on the main spindle and its thread size was 60 millimeter by two millimeter i think so that's like a huge thread and uh, hold on let me grab something so i ended up making an adapter this is 60 millimeter on the back side and then it is, uh, I actually don't remember, I think it's 40 millimeter by 1.5 for the sub spindle draw tube. So this had to go and screw into the sub spindles tube and then it had to match our new collet chuck. So one, I've never thread milled anything this big. So I had to learn how to do that and get it to work. So I have literally the entire uh, main and sub spindles designed uh, all modeled out to get this to work because I like designing the entire thing that way you can really check if the design uh, checks out so I mean you can imagine that took me a couple days and not to mention the fact that this is a uh, I do not remember what the adapter size is but spindles the spindle knows it's called which is the front of the spindle that like bolts to the chuck they're like all different. Uh, man, I can't. A25, I think, is what this is, and this is not A25. It's it's different. So I ended up having to like look up the standards and figure out the uh, like the bolt spacing and everything. So this three bolt pattern goes into this aluminum adapter, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then that goes into this, and I think it's 110 millimeter is what the the nose on here is called. So I basically had to prototype a couple adapters and get them all to fit. And then another thing is, see this uh, this area right here? So this is the adapter, uh, this part right here, I think. Yeah, this is the adapter right here. This is was part of the chuck I got. It was sitting out like another inch. And I ended up facing it down to get this to basically match and have no clearance issues with the turret. So there was literally a ton of things going on to get this to work. Now, my one saving grace for this whole system and getting it like concentric to the main spindle to actually get it to transfer is this really expensive collet chuck actually has this fancy, and it's not fancy, but it is a way to adjust the radial alignment uh, so basically how concentric this is on the chuck itself. So if you see these screws right here, they're kind of hard to see. Let me turn on. Adjusting these screws, actually, this plate kind of floats on, an, on the interior plate, and you're able to actually move the nose around where you need to. So, like, let's say you were not very concentric. Like, let's say your adapter kind of sucked, and... Uh, that's definitely a possibility. Um, there's a lot of stack up going here. So like that was definitely, that is what happened. Um, so I used this and I corrected that kind of stack up error. And now this runs very true. And it's, I found <laughs> obviously through my pain and suffering that the sub spindle needs to run dead nuts to the main spindle to get anything to transfer. Now, Obviously, really, really small things. You'll notice that this is not a circle, it's a square. Transferring squares is really, really important to get everything lined up and uh, centered. So uh, this was a necessary purchase in the, uh, the machining saga, I guess, of making things. The chuck jaw thing was not gonna work long-term and I'm glad I went this way and sometimes it's okay to spend the money that you need to to get the things to work. The good thing about this is 5C collets are not expensive. You can buy emergency ones. They're very hard. Like this thing destroys titanium before it destroys the jaws, and even though it's small. 
like and they're cheap i mean this square this square 5c is like 80 dollars from mcmaster i mean the time you spend making custom jaws every time you know that 80 bucks that's nothing so that's my rant on spending money <laughs> and uh yeah so anyways back to the tweezer caps so the tweezer caps obviously main spindle do all this fancy milling and then uh, obviously this is not the right call it, but come in here, grab this, and then do this finish. And uh, this is off the machine, not touched. And if it focuses any better, you can see that you can't really tell that it was machined in two different ups, which is awesome. But I also made sure to blend the the uh, up two with this uh, little bowl, the little uh, what do we call that dip. So it uh, just blends it even better. So yeah, uh, I also, McMaster sells this little 5C collet stop thing that goes in the back of the 5C. And obviously this is not for the, this is for the square spacers um, on, the, on the knife. So there's a spring in here now. And basically when this opens up, the spring pushes the uh, square spacer and uh, it works really good. So yeah, I, Probably won't do a video on those square spacers that I keep talking about, but basically it took me quite a few days to get the square spacers for the knife working, and I started working on those after I had made a bunch of these tweezer caps. So if you're wondering what I am talking about, that is the timeline. Alright, so I'm just going to cut the video here. I am going to start recording a video on like working on the tweezers, doing some anodizing, and just like walking through an order so you guys can see my ordeal and the complicated system I've created. It's not that complicated, but... I'm just making a big deal of it. Uh, so yeah, so um, like I said, if you want to buy some tweezers, they're going to be on the website. They are on the website, so I'll link that in the description. Um, I am still working on knives. I probably will have number 10 done, to, not today, this week. Um, I'm working on some uh, tumbling changes, and I'm still working on all the fixtures and stuff. So... Uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, obviously subscribe and do all that fun stuff. And if you want to see daily stuff, then you can check out Instagram. And that's, it's the same username as on YouTube. It's split141. And uh, I appreciate you guys watching. And uh, have a good one.